evening. It's Wednesday, June 15th. The gunman who shot and killed 10 African Americans in a racist massacre at a Buffalo supermarket charged with federal hate crimes today. Peyton Gendron could face the death penalty. Lawmakers in Washington keeping at it in efforts to respond to mass shootings, school shootings, and other kinds of gun violence. Two House committees and a Senate committee take up the issue today with one voting on a bill to create an active shooter alert system. The Federal Reserve intensifies its drive to tame high inflation by raising its key interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point, the largest hike in nearly three decades. The U.S. says it will send an additional $1 billion in military aid to Ukraine. It's the largest single infusion of weapons since the Russian invasion nearly four months ago. President Biden issues an executive order to stymie what his administration calls discriminatory legislative attacks on the lesbian and gay community by Republican-controlled states. And Democratic senators urge President Biden to immediately issue an executive order with detailed actions to defend the right to an abortion. Their call comes with the Supreme Court expected to hand down a ruling within days overturning the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion nationwide. From Pacifica Radio, KBFA Berkeley, KBFK Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Maracle. Attorney General Merrick Garland announced today that the white supremacist charged with murder and other felonies in the Buffalo, New York massacre has been charged with federal hate crimes that could carry the death penalty. Rachel Silverman reports. The Justice Department has charged Peyton Gendron with a total of 26 counts of hate crimes and weapons violations. Some of those charges could carry the death penalty. The criminal complaint says the evidence shows there's probable cause Gendron shot the 11 black victims at the grocery store because of their actual and perceived race and color and shot two white victims while trying to harm the others. Gendron wore body armor and carried a semi-automatic rifle while live streaming the attack online one month ago, an attack that left 10 people dead and three others wounded. Rachel Silverman, San Francisco. The filing of the new federal hate crimes against the 18-year-old coincided with a visit to Buffalo by the Attorney General. Garland met with the families and laid flowers at a memorial outside the Topps Friendly Market. The affidavit in support of the complaint quotes the defendant as stating that his goal was to, quote, kill as many blacks as possible. The affidavit outlines how the defendant prepared for months to carry out this attack. It alleges that he selected a target in this zip code because it has the highest percentage of black people close enough to where he lives. He selected the top store because it is where a high percentage and high density of black people can be found. The federal hate crimes case is based partly on documents in which Gendron laid out his radical racist worldview and extensive preparation for the attack, some of which he posted online and shared with a small group of people shortly before he started shooting. FBI agents executing a search warrant at Gendron's home found a note in which he apologized to his family and wrote he had to commit this attack because he cares for the future of the white race. That's according to an affidavit filed with the criminal complaint. Three children of 86-year-old victim Ruth Whitfield said... They told the attorney general at their private meeting that they wanted to make sure he did not view the Buffalo shooting as a singular case. This is a problem throughout America, said one son, former Buffalo Fire Commissioner Garnell Whitfield Jr. Another said that, quote, it doesn't stop with justice for our mother and the other nine victims. It's how do we prevent these horrific crimes from happening for breaking the hearts of other families. 
The Federal Reserve Board intensified its drive to tame high inflation today by raising its key interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point, the largest hike in nearly three decades, and signaling more large rate increases to come that would risk another recession. The move the Fed announced after its latest public policy meeting will increase its benchmark short-term interest rate, which affects many consumer and business interest rates on their loans. The central bank is ramping up its drive to tighten credit and slow growth with inflation having reached a four-decade high of 8.6%, spreading to more areas of the economy and showing no signs of slowing down. Sarah Walton reports. Analysts have described the interest rate hike as aggressive as the Federal Reserve looks to tackle rapidly increasing inflation in the US. The move takes the Fed's benchmark interest rate to a range of 1.5 to 1.75 percent, the highest it's been since before the COVID-19 pandemic. The report from the central bank following their two-day meeting also cut the outlook for economic growth in the US for 2022 from 2.8 percent to 1.7 percent. But the committee said it was still largely optimistic about the economy, saying Job gains have been robust in recent months, with unemployment remaining low. I'm Sarah Walton in New York. Silicon Valley Democrat Ro Khanna is calling for passage of legislation to tax oil windfall profits. The Big Oil Windfall Profits Tax Act would return windfall taxes to consumers in the form of a quarterly rebate which would phase out for single filers who earn more than $75,000 in annual income and joint filers who earn more than $150,000 a year. At current prices, single filers would receive approximately $240 each year. Joint filers would get roughly $360 a year. Kana's office said the legislation would provide consumers guaranteed relief while maintaining American competitiveness and reducing pressure on inflation by attacking corporate profiteering. Meanwhile, President Biden wants U.S. oil refiners to uh, to produce more gasoline and diesel. In a letter to refiners today, Biden said their profits have tripled during a time of war between Russia and Ukraine as Americans struggle with with record high prices. Biden writes the oil companies need to work with his administration on near-term solutions addressing the problem. Gas prices nationwide average roughly $5 a gallon, an economic burden for many Americans and a political threat for Biden's fellow Democrats before midterm elections. Biden's message that corporate greed contributes to higher prices might resonate with some voters. Meanwhile, climate justice groups are slamming the president's move, arguing increased oil drilling and production will not solve the current problem, but will sacrifice frontline communities to the oil refineries. Those communities are predominantly black and brown and continue to bear the brunt of the climate crisis. A coalition of frontline communities and environmental justice organizations says Biden should call on the fossil fuel industry to stabilize prices rather than beef up oil production. The coalition is also calling on Biden to declare a climate emergency and immediately invest in transitions to wind, solar, and other renewable energy sources. Democratic senators are urging President Biden to immediately issue an executive order with detailed actions to defend the right to an abortion. Senators Patty Murray and Elizabeth Warren say the need is urgent, with the Supreme Court expected to hand down a ruling within days overturning the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion nationwide. Eileen Alfandari reports. Washington Democrat Patty Murray says there's a lot the Biden administration could do to help protect access to abortion. Murray says, though, when she pressed Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra on the issue last month, his response fell short. Last month, when the draft Supreme Court decision was leaked, I pushed Secretary Becerra on the administration's plan. I'll be frank. I was not satisfied with the answer. Fair warning. Mr. President, we are going to be loud. 
we're going to be relentless mm -hmm. because, Mr. President, we need a plan to protect reproductive rights in America, and we need it now. Murray and Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren led about two dozen Democratic senators who wrote a detailed letter outlining executive orders they say would pass legal muster. They want federal agencies to increase access to medication abortions and provide travel vouchers and child care for people who will need to travel out of state for the procedure. They say the Department of Health and Human Services should more aggressively enforce federal requirements guaranteeing Medicaid beneficiaries can seek family services from their provider of choice, including Planned Parenthood. Warren also wants to ban cell phone location data brokers from selling tracking information that could disclose someone's visit to get an abortion. Today, Senator Murray and I, along with three of our colleagues, introduced a bill to ban shady data brokers from selling the most sensitive data about everyday Americans, their health and their location data. Data brokers have been caught selling cell phone-based location data for women who visit abortion clinics, risking the safety of those women and women everywhere. It is long past time to pass some basic rules of the road for this unregulated $200 billion industry that is profiting from putting human beings at risk. Congress can act and the administration can also act on its own. The senators also want the administration to consider offering abortion services on federal land within states that have banned the procedure. With the U.S. Supreme Court poised to overturn or severely weaken the Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion nearly 50 years ago, Murray said it's an all-hands-on-deck moment. Warren echoed the sentiment. With abortion rights on the line, it is time for a whole-of-government response once again. We don't have a second to waste in this national emergency because, let us be clear, we are not going back. Not now, not ever. I'm Eileen Alfandari for Pacifica Radio, KPFA. President Joe Biden marked Pride Month today by signing historic executive orders to counter what the White House says are discriminatory legislative attacks on the lesbian, gay community by Republican-controlled states. Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris organized a reception this afternoon featuring community leaders, members of Congress, and top administration officials. Violet Ballou reports. First Lady Jill Biden spotlighted the record of the Biden administration as the first to appoint so many openly LGBTQ plus officials. Last month, when the White House named Karine Jean-Pierre as the new press secretary, she became the first out LGBTQ person to take the high profile job. Jill Biden also denounced the red state's laws that have restricted school discussions of gender identity and sexuality. In places across the country, like Florida, Texas, or Alabama, rights are under attack. And we know that in small towns and big cities, prejudice and discrimination still lurk. It shouldn't take courage to be yourself. It shouldn't take courage to go to school and walk down the halls as the person you know you are. According to the National Crime Victimization Survey of 2017, LGBT people over 16 years old are nearly four times more likely to experience violent victimization than their straight peers. Javier Gomez is an 18-year-old student who recently graduated from high school in Florida. He's one of the many LGBTQ activists who has been fighting against the Don't Say Gay law in his state. He shared his difficult coming out experience and emphasized the key role of educators in supporting LGBTQ kids. When I was five years old, I knew I was different. I knew I liked boys, but I didn't know the words for it. I was mocked and bullied. As I grew older, coming out was a rocky process. But my fifth grade teacher provided me the support I needed to understand my identity. I fear other students in Florida and across the country would not be able to get the same support because of hateful legislation 
like the Don't Say Gay Bell. The orders signed by the president seek to discourage conversion therapy, which is a discredited practice that aims to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. The orders are also intended to promote gender-affirming surgery and expanded foster care protections for gay and transgender parents and children. Biden said his order will also focus on children's mental health. Today, I'm about to sign an executive order that directs key federal agencies to protect our communities from those hateful attacks and advance equality for families. The executive order will also support mental health for children by addressing bullying and suicide and making our schools safer. Addressing the nation's mental health crisis is a key pillar of the unity agenda I announced in the State of the Union address. Biden urged Congress to approve the Equality Act. The measure would amend the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to also prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex, sexual orientation and gender identity. The House has already approved the measure, but it is stalled in the Senate. I'm Violette Bellou for KPFA, Pacifica Radio. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at KPFA. Dot org. Lawmakers in Washington are keeping up at their efforts to respond to mass shootings, school shootings, and other kinds of gun violence. Two House committees and a Senate committee took up the issue today, with one voting on a bill to create an active shooter alert system. Christopher Martinez reports. Lawmakers in the House and Senate took up the issue of gun violence Wednesday in a series of legislative hearings. The Senate Judiciary Committee focused on the impact of gun violence on children, opening with a sometimes disturbing video. We were all panicking because we didn't know what was really happening. I was playing dead, so he won't shoot me. This right here is the uh, picture of the bully that entered my head. I was in behind a boy, Nicholas, and... When he fell over, I just followed his every movement and I fell over with him. And then I put him on top of me because he was already. I just told myself I need to look like I look. I'm, I'm dead. Democratic Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois is chair of the committee. He called for the hearing after the Uvalde school shooting. Gun violence is traumatizing an entire generation of American kids. American kids now fear a shooting could happen in their school any day. And in 27 American schools so far this year, it has. The committee heard from a panel of experts, among them Max Schachter, the father of a boy killed in the Marjorie Stone Douglas High School shooting. After the shooting, I was consumed with grief and anger. After 9-11, we made the airplanes safer. After the Oklahoma City bombing, we made the federal building safer. Yet I could not understand how more than 20 years after Columbine, Children and teachers continue to be murdered in their classrooms. Another witness, Dr. Moira Shilaji, is president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She says there's only so much pediatricians can do. Keeping children safe is a duty we all collectively share as a society. But in this duty, I am sorry to say we have failed our children. Gun deaths are preventable. Yet every year, 3,500 children and teens die by firearm. Put another way, that is like having a, an Ovalde scale tragedy every other day. As that hearing continued, a House subcommittee held another hearing on tools to combat gun trafficking and gun violence. And in the House Judiciary Committee, lawmakers held an actual vote on a bill. Democrat Dave Cicilline of Rhode Island brought up his H.R. 6538, the Active Shooter Alert Act of 2022. The Active Shooter Alert creates an Amber Alert-like program for active shooter events. This bill will provide law enforcement with cutting-edge technology to send notifications to our smartphones and let communities know if there's an active shooter in a certain area so that they know to stay away. The measure has support from law enforcement groups like the Fraternal Order of Police and the National Association of District Attorneys, as well as Democratic lawmakers like Madeline Dean of Pennsylvania, the vice chair of the committee. I am a sad yet proud co-sponsor of the Active Shooter Alert Act. Sad that we need it in this country, proud because it is an attempt at a solution to make people safer. Several Republican lawmakers have also co-sponsored the bill, but not all Republicans on the Judiciary Committee were in support. Jim Jordan of Ohio was the ranking Republican on the committee. Don't be fooled. This isn't about Democrat support for law enforcement. This is an election year cover for Democrats who spent the last two years 
demonizing law enforcement, demonizing our men and women in uniform, and slashing their local police budgets. Republican Daryl Issa of California said he would support the bill if the author accepted what he described as two minor amendments to change the name of the bill. I'd like to expand in two ways the bill. First of all, by changing the title of the bill to Life-Threatening Emergency Systems Act. What we're really doing by striking shooter alert and changing the insert is we're harmonizing with existing names that states like New Jersey have already adopted. That amendment did not go over well with Democrats, who noted that a Texas alert system uses a similar name as the proposed bill, Texas Active Shooter Alert Program. Democrat Cicilline rejected the amendment. The bill is entitled the Active Shooter Alert System because it responds to a, an actual problem of an active shooter. This was crafted, as I said, in consultation with six law enforcement agencies to respond to dangers that law enforcement faces with respect to active shooting. In the end, the amendment failed and the bill passed out of committee on a voice vote, paving the way for a vote of the full House of Representatives. Meanwhile, a group of senators has already released a framework for a modest gun violence bill, raising hopes for some action in the Senate. Democratic Senator Lloyd Doggett of Texas told reporters he has concerns about that Senate framework, adding, I don't want to have missed an opportunity since we've done nothing for 30 years. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The U.S. announced it will send an additional $1 billion in military aid to Ukraine. As America and its allies provide longer-range weapons they say can make a difference in a fight where Ukrainian forces are outnumbered and outgunned by their Russian invaders. President Biden and his top national security leaders said today the U.S. is moving as fast as possible to get critical weapons into the fight. Even as Ukrainian officials protest, they need more and more faster in order to survive. The latest package, the U.S. said, includes anti-ship missile launchers, howitzers, and more rounds for high-mobility artillery rocket systems, HIMARS, that U.S. forces are now training Ukrainian troops on. All are key weapon systems that Ukrainian leaders have urgently requested as they battle to stall Russia's slow but steady march to conquer the eastern Donbass region of Ukraine. The aid is the largest single tranche of weapons and equipment since the war began. Biden, who spoke by phone with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky for about 40 minutes today, also said the U.S. will send $225 million more in humanitarian assistance to provide safe drinking water, medical supplies, food, health care, shelter, and money for families to buy essential items. The aid comes as Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin convened a meeting in Brussels of more than 45 nations to discuss support for Ukraine. Rosie Burchard reports from Brussels. After more than three months of Russian attacks, Kyiv has received significant financial and military aid from the U.S. and other NATO allies. But Ukrainian officials say the country needs more heavy weapons to bolster defenses as the war drags on. Alliance members are expected to pledge further support to Ukraine, which is not a member. But they'll also look into beefing up internal defences with significant increases in troop deployments in Eastern European and Baltic member countries, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine prompting a rethink of security risks. Rosie Burchard, Brussels. The new $1 billion package includes $350 million in rapid off-the-shelf deliveries by the Pentagon and $650 million in other long-term purchases. All combined, the U.S. has now committed about $6.3 billion in security assistance to Ukraine since the beginning of the Biden administration, including approximately $5.6 billion since Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin addressed a press conference in Brussels. We built tremendous momentum for donations and delivery of military assistance. And after this this afternoon's discussions, we're not just going to maintain that momentum, we're going to move even faster and push even harder. We'll deepen our coordination and cooperation and will bolster Ukraine's armed forces to help them repel Russian aggression now and in the future. So we'll continue working closely and intensively 
together with this contact group and we'll keep on strengthening our support for Ukraine's self-defense and we'll continue to stand up for the rules-based international order that protects us all. Meanwhile, the Russian military said today it used long-range missiles to destroy a depot in the western Lviv region of Ukraine where ammunition for NATO-supplied weapons was stored. And the governor of a key eastern city acknowledged that Russian forces are advancing in heavy fighting. The battle for Severo Donetsk in Ukraine's eastern Donbass area has become the focus of Russia's offensive in recent weeks. Russian-backed separatists accused Ukrainian forces of sabotaging an evacuation of civilians from that city's besieged as a chemical plant, where about 500 civilians and an unknown number of Ukrainian fighters are believed to be sheltering from missile attacks. It was impossible to verify the claim. Russian officials had announced a humanitarian corridor from the Azot plant a day earlier, but said they would take civilians to areas controlled by Russian, not Ukrainian, military forces. The Ukrainian governor of Luhansk told the Associated Press that heavy fighting in Severodonetsk continued today, and the situation in the city is getting worse. In the Lviv region near the border with NATO uh, member Poland, Russian forces used high-precision caliber missiles to destroy the depot near the town of Zolochiv. The United Nations Children Agency, UNICEF, is detailing the impacts of the war in Ukraine on children. Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia, Afshan Khan, visited the war-torn nation last week and called for an end to the conflict. So again, the use of explosive weapons in populated areas and attacks on civilian infrastructure clearly must stop. It's killing and maiming children and preventing them from returning to any sense of normal life in in their towns, in their cities, and in their homes. And I've seen a number of children, even young, young children, severely traumatized by what they've witnessed. She said that nearly two-thirds of Ukraine's children are displaced, adding that the numbers are staggering and bear repeating. While Russian forces are making slow progress in their drive to conquer the Donbass region of Ukraine, their advance has not been steady. The Ukrainian military has had some successes in retaking areas of real estate previously lost. Nearly four months into the war, you might call the contest so far a draw. John Pfeffer is the Director of Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington. He spoke with Brian edwards Tickert on the Upfront program. You would think that a stalemate like the one that we seem to have entered into uh, in Ukraine would push both sides to the negotiating table. But that really hasn't happened. And I think in part it's because... Um, both sides still believe that they can win more, or however they define winning, um, on the ground. Uh, Russia is, uh, I think, as you, you have said, um, really made incremental uh, increases in, in territorial acquisition in the Donbass through artillery um, attacks, uh, just pounding positions uh, held by Ukraine. Um, it is politically consolidating or attempting to consolidate uh, its control over Kherson and, and areas around Kherson. Uh, but Ukraine believes that help is on the way. I mean, it's, it's basically run out of Soviet era uh, ammunition and, and armaments, but uh, it believes that the military assistance primarily provided by the United States will um, will kind of even out the disadvantage it has, especially in terms of long-range artillery. Uh, and that once it gets that assistance, it can not only stop Russian advance, but push it back. So both sides, I think, still believe that they can win militarily. And because of that, they don't see any compelling reason to sit down and talk to each other. The one exception to that would be on this question of grain um, and the uh, the exporting of grain out of the Black Sea ports. 
Belarus is primarily Odessa. Um, and, you know, both Russia and Ukraine have an interest in getting grain to market. Um, and so Turkey is kind of trying to negotiate some kind of a settlement, uh, you know, playing on the, the self-interest of both sides. But that's really the only kind of negotiations that are going on. And that doesn't really have anything, uh, doesn't, won't have real impact on peace negotiations, per se. And Pfeffer of Foreign Policy in Focus says Russian President Putin can probably afford to be very patient in his effort to subdue Ukraine, figuring time is on his side. As high oil and natural gas prices stemming from the war disrupt Western economies, and depending on the inevitable change in democratic governments of the West, both of those likely to pull apart what's now a united coalition of nations willing to provide massive aid to Ukraine's resistance to the Russian invasion. Uh, according to, you know, unnamed sources near to Putin, uh, the Russian president believes that the economic pain that will be suffered primarily by Europeans, as well as the political fallout from that, in other words, um, voting out the current leaders uh, of these governments, perhaps seeing a, a change in government in the United States as well, will change uh, completely the political dynamic or the geopolitical dynamic in the sense that uh, the solidarity that European governments and the United States government is showing to Ukraine will dissolve rather quickly. Um, so I think the, the rise in price for natural gas and, and, I mean, energy in general in Europe is going to have its political um, uh, impact and uh, eventually some measure of geopolitical impact. Um, and the question really is, uh, you know, the degree to which European consumers connect this to two things. One, you know, their their professed solidarity with Ukrainian uh, victims in this war. And the second is um, their willingness to pay for an energy transition in general. So, you know, what's happening today in Europe is just an accelerated version of what we would expect to happen later in the decade as uh, Europe and other countries race to meet their Paris uh, climate commitments um, rather significant reductions in uh, fossil fuel uh, consumption. I mean, we're supposed to, in three years, hit peak carbon emissions and then a cut by 50% by 2030. Um, and in order to do that, that's going to require enormous sacrifices, whether we're sacrificing, you know, in solidarity with Ukrainians or we're doing it because we want to save the planet. Uh, so these are going to be hard kind of economic and political choices, which we are kind of facing right now as a result of the war rather than, say, in one or two years. John Pfeffer of Foreign Policy in Focus. And this is the Evening News. You're listening on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno. Online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 o'clock. I'm Mark Miracle. A federal judge today convicted a Confederate flag-toting man and his son of charges they stormed the U.S. Capitol together during the insurrection of January 6, 2021, to obstruct Congress from certifying Joe Biden's presidential victory. U.S. District Judge Trevor McFadden delivered the verdict from the bench after hearing two days of testimony without a jury for the trial of Kevin Seafried and his adult son, Hunter. Judge McFadden convicted both Delaware men of a felony count, obstruction of an official proceeding, which is the uh, joint session of Congress for certifying the Electoral College that day. The judge also convicted the Seafreeds of misdemeanor charges that they engaged in disorderly conduct. They'll remain free pending separate sentencing hearings in September. The House Select Committee investigating the Capitol insurrection plans to focus its hearing tomorrow on the pressure that Donald Trump put on his vice president, Mike Pence, in a last-ditch and ostensibly illegal plan to stop Joe Biden's election victory. 
Trump seized on the proposal from right-wing law professor John Eastman to have Pence turn back the legitimate electors when the vice president presided over Congress to certify the election results on January 6, 2021. Traditionally, January 6th is a ceremonial day, a procedural step, tallying the presidential vote. But Eastman's unusual plan, bold he called it, was to have alternative slates of electors not selected by a state's voters but by Trump's supporters submitted to Congress, leaving Pence no choice but to return them to the states to sort it all out. Biden would be denied a majority and Trump could win as the defeated Trump watched dozens of court cases challenging the 2020 presidential election collapse. He turned to the Eastman plan as a last resort to stay in office. John Eastman is one of the most brilliant lawyers in the country, and he looked at this, Trump told thousands of his supporters at a rally near the White House before sending them to the Capitol on January 6th. And he looked at Mike Pence, and I hope Mike is going to do the right thing. I hope so. I hope so, because if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election, the then president said. The January 6th committee is viewing this as a grave, grave threat to democracy. That's according to a committee aide who was granted anonymity to discuss the matter before tomorrow's hearing. And you can hear more about the plot from the committee's hearing tomorrow. KPFA and Pacific Radio will be airing live coverage beginning at 10 a.m. tomorrow, hosted by Mitch Jesuits of the Letters and Politics Show. Today marks the 10th anniversary of DACA, a federal program that shields from de deportation many undocumented immigrants brought to the United States as children. They're known as dreamers. DACA recipients, advocates, and Democrats gathered at the nation's capital to demand Congress pass the DREAM Act, legislation that would provide a pathway for citizenship for the dreamers. New Jersey Senator Democrat Bob Menendez. It's been 10 years since hundreds of thousands of undocumented immigrants were given the opportunity to go to school and work in the only country they have ever called home. I say about dreamers all the time, the only flag they pledge allegiance to is that of the United States. The only national anthem they know is the Star Spangled Banner. The only country they have ever called or felt is home is the United States of America. And so, two, uh, we want to say unequivocally and unapologetically that the progress and gains and the triumphs of the past 10 years are here to stay. DACA's future is in limbo. The Biden administration is challenging a judge's order barring the Department of Homeland Security from approving new DACA requests after a group of Republican states led by Texas challenged its legality. Unless Congress acts and passes the DREAM Act, the fight over DACA's legality is likely to end up in the U.S. Supreme Court, where now, with a conservative majority, its future is highly uncertain. Grace Martinez is undocumented and the executive director of United We Dream. DACA is our victory, but we have more to win. DACA has been under attack since its inception in 2020. There are real forces working against us. They're not shy about what they want. They want to kill the DACA program. And right now there's a court case that is led by uh, nine Republican attorneys general that wants to end DACA. The reality is that DACA will end at the Supreme Court again, leaving immigrant young people like myself and many others in a continued state of limbo. Not only that, but there are over 80,000 eligible young people who have applied for the program for the first time last year. And their applications have been frozen by the same court cases. These are all reminders that DACA has never gone far enough to protect undocumented communities. And that is why I am here today. The 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals will hear arguments on DACA on July 6. DACA and new legislation to bolster access to higher education for immigrant students were the topics of a Senate hearing chaired by California Senator Alex Padilla. Sam Canfield has that story. California Democrat Alex Padilla says Congress must find a more permanent replacement for DACA so that DREAMers can fully contribute to American society. 
DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, is in legal limbo and Congress has not passed legislation making it law. Congress must pass a legislative solution for DREAMers so more students can earn their degrees and join our workforce. Our economy needs the talents and passion of immigrant youth. That's why immigration reform in higher education is a bipartisan issue and a top priority for America's business community. Undocumented immigrants brought to the U.S. as children only know this country is home, but they face barriers that their American-born neighbors and friends who they grew up with don't, such as Daria Larios. The resident doctor at Harvard and a DACA recipient describes the extra hurdles she faced when applying for college. Still, the specter of my undocumented status has shattered every major transition of my life. Despite graduating in the top 1% of my high school class with nearly 700 students, I never knew if I would be able to attend college, let alone afford it. As an undocumented student, I was not eligible for federal or state financial aid. State laws classified me as an international student, which raised tuition and excluded me from most forms of institutional scholarships. Some colleges asked me to provide proof of U.S. citizenship and permanent residency if I wanted to attend classes beyond one semester. Larios risks deportation if DACA is dissolved, despite growing up in the U.S., paying taxes as an adult, and being a well-educated doctor. There are more than 600,000 DACA recipients nationwide, many with similar experiences as hers. According to Bernard Burola, vice president at the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities, International students are equally as important to the nation. They make up 50% of all graduate students pursuing STEM degrees in the U.S. and contribute billions to the economy in tuition, living expenses, and dozens of billion-dollar startups that they have created. Borola says the number of international students attending American universities is down for reasons other than the pandemic. Compared to five years ago, international student enrollment has declined by 21%. Now, the pandemic accounts for some of this decline, but even if we look at the period prior to the pandemic, uh, international student enrollment had declined by 7% between 2016 and 2020. This would not be as serious of an issue if other countries also saw similar declines. Instead, other countries have seen double-digit increases in their enrollment of international students over the same period. Borola says pathways for student visas, scholarships, and employment-based permanent residency for international students are lacking in America. This is Sam Canfield reporting for Pacifica Radio, KPFA. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled against immigrants who are seeking their release from long periods of detention while they fight deportation orders. In two cases decided earlier this week, the court said the immigrants who fear prosecution if they are sent back to their native countries have no right under a federal law to a bond hearing at which they could argue for their freedom no matter how long they're held. The Justice this is also ruled six to three to limit the immigrants' ability to band together in court. An outcome that Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote will leave many vulnerable non-citizens unable to protect their rights. In recent years, the High Court has taken an increasingly limited view of immigrants' access to the federal court system. The United Kingdom's plan to deport undocumented immigrants to Rwanda, whether or not they're from that African country, has hit a snag. A court halted the first flight set to take off from England yesterday to the African country after opposition from human rights groups sued and the European Court of Human Rights stopped the flight at the last minute. Human rights groups had protested ahead of the meeting. Shame on you! Shame on you! Reporter Sally Patterson has more from London. A last-minute judgment from the European Court on Human Rights ruled that one passenger, an Iraqi man, faced a real risk of irreversible harm if he remained on the plane, and Tuesday's flight was abandoned. The scheme has received criticism from opposition parties, charities and the Church of England. The government, however, has promised the deportation plan will continue. Ministers say the scheme will deter people entering the UK illegally by making dangerous crossings on small boats. Home Secretary Priti Patel insists preparations for the next flight are already underway. 
That's Sally Patterson reporting from London, and this is the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Brian Edwards Teekert from Upfront. When we're running down a story, or an idea, or a debate, we follow our research wherever it takes us. We've interviewed everyone from the head of California's Republican Party to an insurrectionist making the case for property destruction. The thing I love about this job is the moment when we ask a question and you can hear the person on the other end thinking. They are off their talking points. You don't know what's going to come out next. Sometimes it's profound. Usually it's interesting. That's why when the news moves fast... We take the time to go deep. It's up front at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on KPFA. A group of nuclear power opponents is urging California Governor Gavin Newsom not to delay the closure of Diablo Canyon, California's last operating nuclear power plant. PG&E, which owns the plant, plans to permanently shut it down by 2025. However, Governor Newsom recently suggested that PG&E consider prolonging the plant's lifetime because of potential California energy shortages. Sam Ravino reports. PG&E says its Diablo Canyon nuclear reactor in San Luis Obispo generated 6% of the state's power last year. PG&E announced plans to close the reactor in 2016 as part of a deal with environmentalists and union workers. At the time, the utility cited what it said was the recognition that California's new energy policies will significantly reduce the need for Diablo Canyon's electricity output. Tim Judson, executive director of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, says it is still the case that power from the reactor will no longer be needed. With load reductions in PG&E surface territory arising from a number of factors, including the formation of community community aggregate renewable projects, energy efficiency and load reductions, and the expansion of rooftop solar statewide. Some of the projects the state will depend on in the future, such as solar and wind farms, have suffered delays because of the pandemic. State officials also recently warned that Californians could experience blackouts or brownouts triggered by heat waves this summer and for the next several years. Seeking to avoid that fate, Governor Newsom recently suggested that PG&E could seek a share of $6 billion in federal funding the Biden administration established to rescue nuclear plants at risk of closing. The federal funding is intended to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by keeping nuclear plants open. But critics note that Diablo is not eligible for the federal funding. Department of Energy guidance says only plants in states with deregulated energy should apply, but California fully regulates utility power generation. For the plant to continue operating, PG&E would have to fix its aging and perhaps dangerous infrastructure and make investments to comply with California's water cooling regulations. Linda Seeley is vice president of the San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace Group, which is a longtime opponent of the Diablo Canyon nuclear reactor. Every day, every 24 hours, uh, the once through cooling system, which is essential to the operation of the plant because it keeps it from blowing up, um, it sucks in 2.5 billion gallons of water from the Pacific Ocean and circulates it through the plant and dumps it back out into the Pacific Ocean. And it's, when it is dumped out, it's 19 degrees warmer than it was when it came in. Because the coolant water comes from the Pacific Ocean, the nuclear cooling process can also trap and kill aquatic life. Kevin Kemp's, a radioactive waste specialist from the group Beyond Nuclear, argued that continuing to operate the plant beyond its scheduled closing would generate hundreds of tons of highly radioactive waste, with no permanent storage site for it. Activists are also concerned about the plant's location. It is situated on four interconnected earthquake fault lines, even though when the plant was licensed, PG&E asserted that there were no active faults within 18 miles of the site. The plant has since been updated to withstand up to a 7.5 magnitude earthquake, but a larger earthquake could have devastating consequences. Daniel Hirsch, 
retired director of the Program of Environmental and Nuclear Policy at UC Santa Cruz, says that if the cooling were disrupted and the nuclear fuel melted, you could have a, enough radioactive release, according to AUC and NRC studies, that you could wipe out a large portion of the state of California for generations. It's an immense amount of radioactivity. And the only way it is prevented from being released is if the cooling keeps working, if the safety systems keep operating, and most importantly, if there is no earthquake. Californians are divided about whether the plant should be closed. 39% oppose shutting it down, 33% support closure, and 28% are unsure. This is Sam Ravigno with KPFA News. COVID-19 shots for infants, toddlers, and preschoolers in the U.S. have moved a step closer. An advisory panel for the Food and Drug Administration has recommended vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer for children under five. It's the only age group not yet eligible for vaccination against the coronavirus, and many parents have been anxiously waiting <clears throat> to protect them. If the FDA authorizes the shots, there's one more review at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. After all the regulatory hurdles are cleared, the shots should be available early next week at doctors' offices, hospitals, and pharmacies. Dr. Peter Marks, the FDA's vaccine chief, opened today's meeting with data showing what he called a quite troubling surge in young children's hospitalizations during the Omicron wave and noted 442 children under four have died during the pandemic. That's far fewer, of course, than adult deaths, but Mark said those deaths should not be dismissed in considering the need for vaccinating the youngest kids. If the FDA agrees with its advisors and authorizes the shots, there is one more step. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will decide on a formal recommendation after its own advisors vote on Saturday. If the CDC signs off, shots could be available as soon as Monday or Tuesday. Infectious disease specialist Anthony Fauci has tested positive for the coronavirus. The 81-year-old Fauci is fully vaccinated and has received two booster shots. The National Institutes of Health and <clears throat> said Fauci was experiencing mild COVID-19 symptoms. He's President Biden's chief medical advisor and director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. French President Emmanuel Macron suggested today he would soon go to Kiev to meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, but said he would not publicly discuss details about such a trip. Answering a journalist's question during an official visit to Romania, Macron said the timing was right for a visit to Ukraine's capital, but he would not enter into logistical discussions. He met with Romania's president today in Bucharest in preparation for a June 23rd, 24th European Union Leaders Summit in Brussels and a June 29th and 30th NATO Summit in Madrid, Spain. Macron said a message of support must be sent to Ukraine before EU heads of state have to make an important decision at their Brussels meeting. The leaders are scheduled to consider Ukraine's request for EU candidate status. <clears throat> Macron's deeply involved in diplomatic efforts to push for a ceasefire in Ukraine that would allow future peace negotiations. He has frequent discussions with Ukrainian President Zelensky and has spoken on the phone several times with Russian President Vladimir Putin since he launched the invasion in late February. Before leaving France, though, Macron urged the French to give him a strong majority on Sunday in the second decisive round of nationwide parliamentary elections. After the election's first round, Macron's party and allies are expected to keep the biggest number of seats at the National Assembly, but possibly fall short of getting an absolute majority. Macron's government would then still be able to rule, but only by bargaining with legislators. More from reporter Simon Marks. 
He's now got a fresh fight on his hands, this time to hold on to his majority in Parliament. After the first round of the general election in France saw his party neck and neck with a super coalition on the left. If he loses his majority in the lower house in the second round of the election next Sunday, Macron will face huge challenges passing his proposals into law. FSN's Paris bureau chief is Ross Cullen. After the first round of voting, his party and its allies only received received about 25% of the vote and they are neck and neck with a new leftist coalition. Its leader, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, says Macron is set to lose his majority in Parliament. Mélenchon, who successfully united the disparate left-wing parties in France to form a powerful coalition of socialists, greens and communists, is claiming Macron's party has been defeated and he is billing himself as a prime minister in waiting. Sunday's first round saw a turnout of only 47%, the lowest figure since the establishment of the Fifth Republic in France in 1958. Macron needs to find a way of inspiring voters and persuading them to show up if he's to secure a majority in the new parliament, and polls suggest that is currently an uphill battle. With FSN Spotlight, I'm Simon Marks. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights says Myanmar's military junta has tortured children and teens, subjecting them to beatings, stabbings, and mock executions during interrogations. In some cases, children's teeth were removed and fingernails ripped out. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet said the human rights situation in Myanmar continues to rapidly decline. What we are witnessing today is the systematic and widespread use of tactics against civilians in respect of which there are reasonable grounds to believe the commission of crimes against humanity and war crimes. Since February 2021, at least 1,900 killings by the militaries have been reported. The humanitarian situation is dire. Bachelet also says 1 million have been internally displaced. 14 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance in Myanmar. The Concord City Council passed a tenant protection measure at its meeting last night. The council unanimously approved the tenant anti-harassment policy. The bar's landlords from failing to maintain their property, entering tenants' homes at off hours late at night or early in the morning, making unneeded renovations inside tenants' homes or intimidating them. The measure passed after tenants shared their experiences of landlord harassment and abuses at the hearing. Landlord groups largely opposed the measure. People flocked to pools, beaches, and cooling centers in a swath of the Midwest and South, spanning from northern Florida to the Great Lakes today, as a heat wave pushed temperatures into the 90s and beyond, and may have caused the deaths of at least two people. The National Weather Service maintained an excessive heat warning through this evening for most of Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, which have been dealing with the sticky humidity and soaring temperatures. And the heat advisories in place for the Midwest and South stretched all the way eastward to the South Carolina shoreline, covering an area that's home to roughly a third of the country's population. Meteorologists warned that the high temperatures could be dangerous or deadly for some people and advised residents to stay hydrated, remain indoors if possible, take precautions if they must be outside. Driving home the point, the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office tweeted today that it was investigating the deaths of an 89-year-old man and 39-year-old woman for palpable connections to the heat. Mostly sunny and windy around the San Francisco Bay tomorrow with highs in the mid-60s, further inland highs in the mid-70s. Highs in the mid-90s and under sunny skies in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow and partly cloudy in the Los Angeles area with highs in the low 80s. That's it for the news tonight for this Wednesday, June 15th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. It's not freedom when they take away your right to vote. It's not freedom when they dictate what your reproductive rights are. 
It's not freedom when they dictate what books you can read. It's not freedom to live in fear. Join the fight for freedom. Become a KPFA member today at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF, 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide at kpfa.org. 